All right, so here's the advanced Elliott wave. We're going to go, if you were in the last presentation, this one's just going to delve a little further into um, really the trading techniques, all right? Channeling, which is uh, one of the best ways to determine trend, okay? Right, breaking of channels happen before breaking of moving averages. It's really your first indication that the trend is changing. Just as an example. Okay. So here's the risk disclaimer. And at this point, I think everybody has read it. Seen it about a million times today, right? Okay, so there's going to be a lot of uh, text. Okay, and I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to go over some of it. The reason is when you see, or see these presentations later online, you're going to want this as a guide. Um, okay to follow all the specific rules. Really the, really, the three most important rules and the only rules uh, that you really need to know, uh, memorize for Elliott, are that right, wave two can't go below wave one. Wave uh, four can't go below uh, wave three, the beginning of wave three. And wave three is never the shortest wave. And that's really, those are the, the non-breakables. But here we have a couple more detailed rules that you're going to want to keep in mind, right? That wave one must be an impulse or leading to that. For, uh, and what that means is, for example, that wave one can't be three waves, okay? Wave two cannot be a triangle, for example. So if you see a triangle, you know that something else is going on, like a larger correction. Um, Wave three cannot be a diagonal, it has to be an impulse, right? It's gotta be a, a faster moving um, pattern. Okay, and then there are guidelines, right? Rules cannot be broken. Guidelines are tendencies, right? Um, there's so much to Elliott, and these aren't even all the guidelines, but these are the major ones. Right? Wave two is usually sharp. In other words, it's usually a zigzag. Uh, and that makes sense, because think about the position of where wave two is. It's after a major low, or it doesn't have to be a major low, because it happens on any time frame, but think of the psychology that attends to a wave two correction. You have this rally or decline uh, from a significant high or a significant low that is the beginning of a new trend. At this point, the trend's probably so ingrained in most uh, minds that everyone thinks when it goes the other way that it's just a temporary setback. I'll use an example right now of the U.S. stock market. The rally from the low on a larger degree, a primary degree, is probably a second wave. Could be a B wave, whatever. Bottom line is it's a second wave. Uh, and any weakness is met with news headlines of, you know, setback, more or less, right? Everyone believes in this rally. So wave two is usually sharp because it almost takes out wave one and continues whatever was happening. Wave four, meanwhile, is usually more shallow because it follows a very strong move where the market's that much stronger and, you know, the psychological forces that are going to make a correction is probably going to be more sideways than sharp. Okay, and then we have some of the uh, measurements in here, likely retracements for wave two, 50 to 62 percent. Uh, targets for wave five, we'll get into some of this with some uh, real life examples, but right, wave five tends to equal wave one. Okay, it can be related to wave one by a Fibonacci uh, measurement, which is, you know, 161.8 or 61.8. And as I mentioned in the last presentation, someone says, well, what's an extension really mean? Extension uh, is simply one of the waves, a lot of times three, five, or sometimes both, 
is going to be at least 162% uh, or 161.8, okay, uh, of the shortest wave. And then this is a one that you would see even if without an understanding of Elliott, but it helps to understand why this happens. Wave five usually has a lesser slope than wave three, right? The divergence, a, letter, a slower rate of change. Channeling, this is the best, uh, most useful part of Elliott, I think, is channeling. And it's not just impulses, but also corrections. But channeling impulses, once you have three waves up, okay, uh, so you're in a sideways corrective pattern and you think wave four is underway. Okay, so at this point, you can draw a line from one to three. You take a line parallel to that and extend it from the bottom of two. So you have a temporary, a temporary line. And then once price gets close to that line, you look for signs of a bottom. This is a recent example. This is the euro dollar decline from the November high. Uh, I think this is probably on Thursday, so or April 26, it says it on that, so I don't know what day that was. That might have been Monday. But you can see, looking for the fourth wave, that's where it ended. All right, and yeah, this is very easy in, in retrospect, I understand that. Um, but this was also done at the time. I remember, you know, okay, if we go back in the archives of Daily Effects, we can find this temporary channel line and talking about wave four may be complete because we are testing the Elliott channel. That's what I call it, Elliott channel. This is a much longer term example, obviously, but this is the U.S. stock market from the uh, 1930s low, right? We have the five waves, and you can notice this is clearly log scale, but we had the one three line and the fourth wave pinpointed low, the 70s low. And then within wave five, you had the one three, okay? The 2000 high, you were able to draw a line at that point and extend a channel from the wave two low. And that pinpointed the low in after the tech bubble burst and we ended up making a new high. That's why I count that from the bottom of wave four as a five wave rally. Truncation happens when the fifth wave fails to make a new price extreme. Um, he fails to move beyond the end of wave three, whether that's a new high or a new low. This tends to happen if you have an exceptionally strong third wave. In other words, you've moved many multiples of wave one in percentage terms. So uh, this has happened, I believe, in the British pound. After we ran up all the way to 210, we had a decline, okay, which was pretty quick going from 210 to the low 190s, okay, from November of 07 down to January 08, all right? That's a nearly 2,000 pip move uh, in a relatively short amount of time, several months, okay? You can see wave five did not meet the end of wave three on uh, an extreme basis. It did actually on a closing daily basis, but as far as that long wick for the end of three, it did not reach the low. And there was yet another one in the correction there. Wave uh, C did not reach the end of wave A. The thing with truncations is though that you don't know necessarily have an idea that it's happened until uh, you, know, it, you may have retraced the entire move, okay? I don't like to treat things as a truncation. Someone was asking me in the last presentation, we may have made a five wave decline in the dollar yen from the 70s. Does that mean that the decline was truncated? I was explaining I was bearish still, long, long term, because we had yet to break the 1995 low. Well, someone said that could be a truncation. Well, it could be, but the weight of evidence wouldn't favor it. And truncations are rare. I like the market to prove it's a truncation before I assume so. Zigzag rules. Oh, real quick, why truncations are important, even if you recognize them after the fact, is you know then when to count your next count from. In other words, we know that wave three starts from 
here in the pound, okay, that it didn't start from here. Okay, zigzag rules. Wave A must be an impulse or leading diagonal, or it must be a motive wave, right? Can't be three waves. If it's three waves, then you probably have a flat. Wave B can only be a correction, can be a triangle, uh, can be a zigzag itself. It's usually a triangle or a flat in my experience. Uh, you cannot have both waves, A and C, be diagonals either. That does not happen. If that happens, then you probably have the beginning of a larger correction. And think about the psychology that it tends to a zigzag, right? You have a sharp rally off of a, at following an impulsive move, either up or down. So let's say you have a sharp rally following a five-wave decline, and it's impulsive. So you know a larger correction started. The wave B does not retrace a whole lot of wave A, usually a third, maybe half. Um, and the reason is because the impulse off the low provides enough change in psychology that we're not going to go test the lows again, unlike happens in a flat. Okay, guidelines. Wave B most likely a third to two th or a third to a half. I have two thirds there because it can happen, but I don't, it doesn't happen uh, nearly as often as a half or a third in my experience. Wave C tends to be equal to wave A or can extend. Rarely do I find that it's 61.8, but if you do end shy of being equal and you have, you know, reverse and seen some signs of uh, continuation of the larger trend, then check to see if it was uh, related by a Fibonacci ratio, such as 61.8, because then that might have been the end. And again, if wave C is much longer, you know, say wave C is all of a sudden two times longer than wave A, it's probably, you're probably not in a, in a correction anymore. You're probably in um, the beginning of a larger impulse. At that point, you would then look for a wave four correction, right? An example of a zigzag, okay? This was the first wave of the larger triangle, right? But triangles uh, tend to have zigzags within them. And you can see the ABC formation. I didn't do measurements, but would not surprise me if wave C was about 61.8% of wave A in this instance. And you can see also the way to channel. Channeling corrections is different than channeling impulses. But once you have, once you are certain that you're in wave C, okay, then you can uh, put a line connecting the beginning of A, the end of B, and then make your temporary channel extended off of the top of A, and that tends to pinpoint the end of C. Okay, and it did, in this case, it did a pretty good job. You can look at C as well. Within wave C, you can see that that's a diagonal itself, okay? you have three wave movements, five three wave movements, right? One, two, three in the middle, and it overlaps a lot. Oh, I did do the measurement, Never mind. So yeah, the measurement, you can see, this is extremely important too. This is on, I believe, um, arithmetic scale, and this is on log scale. You can see, on arithmetic scale, the uh, channel method pinpointed the high. On log scale, percentage scale, the measuring of 61.8 pinpointed the high. This is important. You need to do both of these when looking at longer term charts because they're, uh, sometimes it you know, conforms to uh, percentage movements and sometimes it will be in pit movements. More likely than not, measurements will be much better in uh, log scale because you are measuring percentage changes, right? A move from 80 to 90 is much different than a move from 140 to 150. Pound yen weekly, this is the same period, obviously, from the 95 low or yen high, and we get the same thing here. This is the euro dollar, um, more or less right now, but you can see this is a, I believe this is a weekly chart, but 
we have ABC down, ABC up. So if we were to, what, where, where are we now, right now in the wave structure? We're in probably larger wave C down of N expanded flat, right? This would be then larger wave A ended at the 2000 low. Larger wave B ended at the 2008 low. Wave C, larger wave C is underway now. We made one, two, we are now in some sort of third wave. My expectations are for it to continue much lower and eventually possibly break the uh, 8225 level in you know, a number of years. It's not gonna happen tomorrow unless Europe blows up or something, I don't know. Okay, Kiwi monthly uh, arithmetic chart, you can see the channeling technique uh, doing from the very top of A, and that's important. Do you see how this doesn't, this wouldn't be considered a normal channel by a lot of technicians because you can see that it stopped, a lot of price is outside of the channel here, but you start from the very beginning of the move, okay? That's important. If, the, if this channel was different, if the line started here, the slope would be a uh, more increased negative slope, and this line would not have come close, right? This line would be somewhere over here. Okay, flats. Wave A, usually a, a flat itself, right? It goes 3, three, uh, three, three 5, or it can be a triangle, 3, 5, 5. The end, wave C must be an impulse or diagonal. A lot of people make too much about, is it a flat or a, or a complex correction, which you have, say, 3, 3, 3. If you were in the last presentation, I was showing the, uh, the pound dollar currently, in which the rally from 147.80 can be subdivided into 3, 3, 3. It looks like a flat, right? But technically it's not. But it really, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It's the end of a correction. Bottom line is, uh, end of a correction you're looking to be to turn bearish in, in that instance sorry okay wave a usually uh, a zigzag of sorts okay wave a rarely uh, like a, a expanding triangle which what I mean by that is I should say diagonal is in leading diagonal uh, wave B usually zigzag, usually a series of zigzags of the first two. Bottom line is that it's not an impulse. Trading uh, flats is somewhat dangerous because it tends to break, you know, you tend to break the bottom of the wave A, you tend to go below. These are the kind of corrections that end up stopping everybody out. But the the kicker, what really sets it off, is that wave uh, C is definitely a, an, an impulse, okay? And a lot of times, it happens where wave C um, in an expanded flat looks like the beginning of a larger decline. In this case, from the 2004 high, you had a decline of five waves from a major high. At the time, you know, reasonable technician would think that a major top was in place, but we ended up exceeding it and going on to 160. So you have a careful examination of what happened. This would be then an expanded flat, right? It's difficult to count this B wave as an impulse because if you think about it, you have here one, two, three, four, five up there but then you don't, but then you have this, so you have A, B, C, you don't have a big four or five, right? Okay, alternation is very useful in that uh, you understand what not to expect. So if you know you're in some sort of third wave, you usually know when you're in a third wave because there are very strong moves. For example, the recent Euro decline, right, from the, I believe it was the February high or January high, uh, you know, uh, was a third wave. And you knew to expect probably a shallower retracement rather than a deep one. So that holds that if wave two is sharp 
or a zigzag, right, then wave four will probably be a flat or a triangle. It's probably not going to be a zigzag. It's not a rule, but it's a guideline. It often holds. And as I mentioned earlier, describing the psychology of the move, it makes sense because if you have a very strong trend, right, that trend is deemed even stronger when the ensuing correction is flatter rather than sharp and against it. And this is an example, I believe this is the pound yen, I think. But you can see the five wave decline from the top, right? And you have a fairly sharp rally. And then you have the fourth wave decline is clearly going to be uh, flatter than the second one, but you would expect that at that point. So from a trading standpoint, you may have some sort of sentiment extreme and very oversold condition down here at three, but you're not going to buy, you know, uh, out of the money, deep out of the money calls or something, or you're not going to uh, establish longer term bullish positions because you are fairly certain the probability favors a flatter correction rather than a sharp one. All right, so getting into Fibonacci, common Fibonacci relationships. These are useful to have uh, just because, you know, knowing when to measure. A lot of people will use Fibonacci, but they may not be using it in the context of the wave principle, so that they're not, they may not be measuring from the correct places. Right? A lot of people measure from a major high or uh, low to the next major high or low, which sometimes, uh, probably most of the time, is correct, but a lot of times, or other times you may have um, a third wave measurement that you're looking for the end of the fourth wave, but they're measuring from the top of one down to the bottom of three. And you're not going to find any meaningful relationship, or it's likely you won't, I should say. Never say never, of course. But these are common relationships. Um, you know, and the most important ones are the ones that relate to each other within an impulse or a correction. What I mean by that is how waves one, three, and five relate to each other, rather than just how wave four relates to three, but how one, three, and five relate to each other and how A and C relate to each other. Okay, the specific setups for Elliott. Um, obviously, you can't trade every single price movement. Um, for one, it's just, it's unreasonable to expect, and two, you introduce the potential for a lot more error. You, you, you can screw up basically a lot more, right? It's hard enough, so you might as well find the best times to get in and get out than uh, try and trade every single little move. But these are what the three I like to follow and I like to uh, look for. And that is one, two base. In other words, you're looking for a larger basing pattern. An example I can give right now of that is the dollar CAD. We had a strong rally off the low. We had a strong decline, right? I'm, the strong decline is a second wave, the way I'm looking at it, my interpretation. Again, it's a strong decline. It retraced, I think, more than two-thirds of the, rally, the recent rally from the low. Um, but second waves usually are sharp, so you know to expect that. It's not a surprise. But it gives you a low-risk entry point because you're very close to the beginning of the, uh, what you were deemed the origin of wave one. It could also be ABC, but bottom line, you're expecting higher prices. The second one is an ending diagonal reversal. Uh, also, you know, could be thought of as the end of a wedge pattern, right? And this happens at the end of larger moves for the most part. And then the last one is finding basically the last correction in a, in a trending uh, market, finding that wave four end, end point. Okay, and remember I talked about the channeling. That's the best way to do that. Okay, so third waves, why do we want them? Because it usually has the most potential for the uh, largest move in the shortest amount of time. And that can be good or it can be terrible if you're on the wrong side. All right. Uh, what are you doing? Very simple. You're looking for a five-wave move from a significant low or high. Now, one way to trick to do this is scan the markets because you don't want to stare at every single chart on every single time frame uh, to find a five wave movement from some high or low, is just throw up a, you know, a, a 20 day rate of change or something, or a, if, if you're longer term, maybe a 13 week rate of change, or if you're even longer term, a 12 month rate of change, and scan to see the historical uh, 
you know, rate of change history and see how it tends to make uh, significant highs or lows. You know, for example, recently on the, I don't know if I had this chart up, but on the Aussie dollar, rate of change has recently exceeded and then declined from a historical record. So on the 12 month, previous instances of doing that indicates, uh, you know, downside for at least several months and usually years. So, you know, have you, have you made a sentiment extreme, a rate of change extreme on a longer term chart. Okay, so this is an example of the 160 decline from 160, I should say. Okay, uh, this is the 60 minute price action at that time. And you can see even on the very small hourly chart, you have the channeling technique that pinpointed uh, the second wave retracement and also happened to be the 61.8 retracement almost to the pip, right? And that's where we made the second wave uh, high or the secondary top. And then the euro tanked for months. Another, uh, another thing before we go on, this chart, remember one of the rules of Elliott is that wave four and wave three don't overlap, right? Clearly, they overlap here, but it's, it says in Elliot's work, he wrote that it does not overlap uh, for a significant amount of time. I take that to mean daily closes. In this case, which is an hourly chart, you have uh, overlap for you know, several hours. In the grand, grand scheme of things, I don't view that to be significant, and his word was for a significant amount of time. So that's how I look at it. And if you were to not have that, you'd have a clear five-wave decline. If you were to pl plot it on closing prices, it looks like a five-wave decline that does not overlap at all. And it is fairly sharp. The slope, you can see it is fairly sharp. Okay, ending diagonal reversals. Remember, diagonal is a wedge. Usually occurs at the end of a larger move. Uh, what you want to do is just like you would, you know, make a triangle, but it's a triangle tilted, right? You draw your lines off of the tops of waves one and three, and then two and four. Wave five usually ends after rallying above the one three line, and then coming back below it. Once it comes below it, you can trade against the high. This is the euro again, back in, this is I think 07, in March of 07. Um, but you can see the tops of one and three, we go above five for a little bit, and then tank two and four. Okay, yeah. Mm hmm. Oh no, rate, rate, just a simple rate of change indicator is just, uh, you're just taking period, say you have a 20 day rate of change. So you would take the indicator is just today's closing price divided by the closing price 20 days ago. So just you know how much we've moved, basically. I like to look at rate of change. Momentum will show you the same thing, except it's subtraction rather than division. But I like to look at rate of change because if you're going back and forth between shorter term and longer term charts, longer term you want to look at uh, rate of change differences rather than absolute because, the, as I mentioned, a movement of 1,000 pips on uh, from you know, 80 to 90 is much more significant than a movement of 1,000 pips of from 140 to 150, right? So you want to know the historical, uh, how rate of change, you know, affects price afterwards, after, how price reacts after a rate of change has been uh, at an extreme level, high or low. You're, I mean, you'll find it on any charting package. It's, on the most, it's one of the most basic, uh, you know, indicators there is. And usually the good, the simple ones are usually the best ones, right? On that note, I know this has nothing to do with Elliott, but it's, I like to look at the pure price. There are so many indicators out there. That alone tells you that most of them don't work very well. Otherwise, they would have stopped a long time ago. But they kept making them, so. Uh, all right. Again, okay, the, the third setup, really looking for the fourth wave, the end of the fourth wave. You're looking for the last correction 
So you've got a third, you would have three waves up at this point, uh, a really strong third wave, right? You've been trading sideways for several, let's say we're looking at daily chart for several weeks. Uh, and what you do is you, you look for the intersection of the channel line and the, uh, you know, but roughly maybe a third retracement. And the, the, I, don't, I didn't have it written down, but the third thing to look for is the former fourth wave of one less degree. Basically, you're looking for a former congestion to hold as congestion again, or as a top or low. So you can see here, this is the euro from, uh, again, the November 08 high, right? We have one, two, January high. We fall very hard in three. We start to trade sideways. So we're gonna look for the end of the fourth. By doing the parallel channeling technique, we find, uh, you know, that it holds, you know, on a more or less on a closing basis, right? And it also holds the fourth of one less degree right here, right, that congestion area. Okay, these are the most common ratios. I know I had the earlier, but these are just the most common, the ones that you wanna hold, uh, pay attention to the most. That is wave two is deep, sharp, right? Usually retraces at least two thirds of the, the wave one rally. Wave three tends to be you know, at least 161.8%. Wave four, about a third of, wa of, uh, of the third wave rally or decline. Uh, wave five tends to equal wave one. Sometimes it's related by Fibonacci ratio, whether that's 61.8 or 161.8. Wave B, uh, depending on what it, you know, what it is, okay, if it's a, a zigzag, right, it's gonna be closer to a third or a half, but if it's an expanded flat, sometimes it'll be as much as 138.2%. And then wave C, one or 161.8. In rare cases, 61.8, remember. This is just an example of uh, these measurements in action. This is the decline from the 04 high at 136.60, remember, in the euro, and we fell to the 05 low roughly a year later. And you can see wave one, we had was 936 pips, okay? Wave two was about 78.6% of 936. Wave three, the extension line, extended a, lit, a, a bit beyond 161.8, okay? Wave four, do not have it here, but it was about a third of the entire decline of three. And finally, wave five was 950 pips, which is pretty darn close to 936 pips, right? Those were equal. This is just uh, obviously a, an example that was hand-picked, right? Because I wasn't gonna show you an example where it didn't work. But uh, no, to, but to, be, to be honest, it, just, it, gives you, it gives you a good idea uh, where to expect support and resistance. So, you know, if we were falling off the cliff here, someone might have said to you, oh, holy cow, the euro's, you know, gonna go to parity at this point. Well, you say, well, it might, but, you know, Jamie Setley told me that wave five equals wave one sometimes. And so you'll look at that and say, we've moved the same amount as we moved in wave one in the same structure. So there's potential for a reversal. Okay, so let's look at some forecasts with Elliott in the immediate future and beyond. This is the dollar yen. Uh, if you were in the last presentation, you saw that we had wave, uh, or estimated that wave four, right, ended in 2007 as a triangle. We've had a decline that's pretty choppy uh, and definitely not an impulse, but it very well may be a leading diagonal, remember? You can have leading diagonals, also ending diagonals. It's kind of uh, a major overlap. Uh, not you know, extremely uh, discernible as, a, as an impulse. So levels that we'd be looking to re, you know, return to a short position may not be until 109 or even 115. And I say that because second waves, again, are usually sharp, right? And especially falling leading diagonals. And then this is the daily chart. This is how I've treated the dollar yen for uh, a while. 
We had the three wave rally off the low. So we are in some sort of correction, but the correction can last for a long time, right? We had a three wave decline, and I think we're uh, heading higher in the second of the three wave rallies, okay? Now, if we were to measure objectives for this, we may have a stopping point near 97, because that's where the first uh, three wave, or the second three wave rally equals the first three wave rally, and then we might, you know, hit the, so you're gonna look for 97, and then you're gonna look for the channel line. Depending on how the rally progresses, the channel line, you know, could be anywhere from 100 in July uh, to, you know, more like 98 or so in, in, in the end of this month. But here's the channel that we made, right? Connecting the bottom of the two, extending from the top. So we have an idea of where we want to place an objective. We might not know when it's going to get there, but we can watch the chart and say when it hits the channel line, it's a good time to get out. So then to review the dollar again, we have a very long term, probably heading lower. It's talking years though. Short term, as in weeks, we're looking for uh, you know, additional strength towards 97 and parity. Yeah. Right, that's a good question. The question is, uh, if there's going to be a correction in the stock market soon, then would people run to safety and buy the yen? They might, There, but there's a ton of Things change all the time, right? Nothing stays the same. The yen's been uh, a safe haven currency because it's a low yielder and it tends to benefit when uh, risk is being taken off as it's borrowed, right? And then they have to cover their positions. But things can change. I can envision a situation where the stock market tanks and the dollar yen soars. It sounds crazy now, but it may very well happen. And think about why you have a, a debt to GDP ratio that's massive in Japan. And what's the story that's taking hold in the global marketplace right now? It's sovereign debt problems. Something like that could afflict, afflict Japan and change the whole dynamic of, of what's going on. So everyone expects the yen to start gaining just because the stock market may weaken, but you know, the marketplace may have changed. You're not gonna know until it does, but I can definitely envision a scenario where that would happen. And that's why it's important to look at each market separately to see what pattern's going on in that own market. Uh, and you may have a, an idea of when market dynamics are going to change, such as this. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying it's possible. You know, therefore, I'm sticking with this count because I see it in the dollar yen chart. I'm not going to change it just because equities are significantly overbought, you know. Yeah. Uh, is, is cycles and whatnot? No, harmonics trading with the bath and all the patterns. Well, harmonics, are you, are you referring to like cyclical? Well, si well, I don't, I have no, I don't, I've never studied Gartley uh, or anything, so I don't know anything about his work to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I've studied some, you know, some cycles, but I don't, I guess I don't find, find them to be reliable enough to rely on uh, but you know I, I just I really haven't I haven't gone through and looked at at Gartley's work or uh, cycle analysis to be honest okay the euro here's the euro dollar uh, monthly chart I believe monthly bars and we had a three wave decline a three wave rally this is probably waves a and b of an expanded flat the ultimate target wouldn't be until below 82, okay? Um, we do have potential support maybe later this year at 114.36, 115 area, which happens to be just below the 05 low and also uh, is the 100% extension uh, in, I believe, in log, in percentage terms, of the move from 160.40 down to 123. Okay, so I have these lines here. Remember, even though I'm assuming right now 
uh, that this is an impulsive decline from the top and that it's going to extend into five waves. But I want to have that line there just in case that is also waves A and B of maybe some ongoing multi-decade correction. Because if we stop and reverse at the channel line on the bottom that I have, then the probability increases that uh, something else is going on. So you, know, you always, you always got to look over your shoulder and have an idea of what may change your forecast, what makes you wrong. And when it does change, you have to change with it. Well, the, a 161.8 extension would place it at 91.40. Okay, um, you know how long it's going to take. Ta time is in, is important. You know, it could fall off a cliff in the next several months, or it could trade sideways and correct higher, and then fall off a cliff. You know, that's not the point. The point is. Uh, that there's the potential for a massive decline if this counts correct, because being in a third wave, we know is exceptionally strong. And so if we get the chance you know, to uh, be short, such as this morning, I talked about the opening of, uh, of the Euro uh, last, in Asia last night, and we reversed at the Asian Open. It's the first day of the month, the first day of the week. It's a wonderful risk point to establish a position against. Use that 133.60 as a stop level because if you go above it, you know that you're probably going much higher, all right, because uh, the first day of the month, the first day of the week thing has been violated, but you're giving yourself a chance to participate in what may be a significant three wave decline. All right, uh, this is getting a little closer to targets as you're talking about as a daily chart, but. You see, I'm treating this as waves one and two up. And remember, wave two is usually sharp. This hardly qualifies as sharp. It didn't even make it back all the way to the former fourth wave. But if this is indeed uh, the beginning of a big time impulse, it's going to take the euro that much lower. You know, it's hard to envision it, but if it's going to take the euro that much lower to, to parity and below, then corrections are going to be shallow along the way. It tells you how much weaker that market really is. All right. Okay, and I had to put this up again. There it is. No. Um, yeah, so there's that. That's my book. It's got some Elliott stuff in it, obviously, including those setups and everything, covered in a little more detail. Um, that is included in there. And, that, <laughs> and you, <laughs> so you wouldn't have any questions. And everyone's probably tired, wanting to go and forget about this stuff for a little bit. Sure. The flats. Okay, well, yeah. And obviously, uh, all this stuff, including the videos, everything's going to be posted online. Don't know where yet, but sure, you'll get an email about it, obviously. F flat. Okay, so flat rules. Yes, the question was just explain more about flats. Um, well, it is, you know, just the way it looks. It's like it sounds. You know, if traditional uh, technicians would probably look at it more as a, uh, a rectangle, right? Targets? Oh, chart. Well, that's a triangle, so I don't have any real flats here. Um, well, this is a flat, as wave two here, okay? What I've labeled as wave two. Not, not that second wave, probably, but the uh, after five, what's larger, larger two? So that would be here, okay, A, B, C. You see, wave B retraced most of uh, wave A, right? Almost made a new low. So you're going to have what? appears to be just a kind of a box formation. But wave C is going to be usually be sharp because it's going to end the pattern, but it's also going to convince a lot of people that there's been a breakout to the upside, and they're going to end up getting in at the worst possible time. That, that uh, C wave ended on April 12th. That was the gap open on a Monday also, which was following Greek, Greek aid plan if I remember correctly. 
So that's what completed that flat, right? And everyone was convinced that we were probably going back to 140. Right. Well, the best thing to do is the channeling, right? Um, connect the bottoms of wave one and three here, and then extend it from wave two, and that's the best way. A lot of people place too much emphasis on retracements. The most important relationships, Fibonacci relationships in a market, are the relationships between the waves of the impulse or the correction. In other words, how wave threes, how waves one, three, and five relate to each other. Not how waves two uh, relates to one or how four relates to three, all right? The, the most important relationship, are, as I said, are those ones that relate in the same direction. Waves uh, four are the best with the channel. It's the best way to look for, look for completion of the wave four, yeah. Are there any software programs that are doing a good job? There are software programs. Um, I don't know if they do a good job though, because they're, you know, they're they're not. Uh, I don't know how popular they are to be honest, but I don't, to, to have a program that's going to spit it out, and it's um, it's just not supposed to be that easy. Which is probably why it doesn't work, you know. I mean, there's always multiple counts. There's always multiple counts. Anything can really happen, right? You just have to figure out what's probably going to happen and align yourself with that situation. Uh, for example, right now in the euro, you know, we could be, uh, let's look at this right here. In the euro, we could have maybe a rally that goes up to above 151.50, but it's probably not gonna happen because the decline that we had is sharp and impulsive, right? I don't know how, how this would be labeled, uh, and there's also other elements such as sentiment that you wanna introduce to your analysis with Elliot because you want to see uh, you know, when extremes in sentiment occur, which tend to be in the third and fifth waves. Okay, B waves have sentiment extremes too, but none of that is taken into account with a, a pure mechanical system. Um, I am sure that there are very bright, intelligent people working on this stuff somewhere, and maybe they haven't shared it with anyone. You know, I don't know, but um, I I don't know of any any technical uh, computerized program for Elliot that I would recommend. So, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Wait, why couldn't it be wave one in a five? Well, this is another reason we have, look at, the, it could be, it could, there could be a lot of stuff, but we have, uh, we had the, from declining, from the 04 high, we had a five wave decline, which completed an expanded flat. We also have a perfect channel as it relates in corrections. Remember in channels, the beginning of the correction in the B wave, and then you extend a parallel and then that pinpoints the end of the rally. The rally ended there, therefore, it's probably a correction because impulses don't channel that way, right? Channeling is the most important, I think, really overlooked part of Elliott. It shows you where to start your channel lines and um, helps you understand you know, what's probably going to happen in the future. In this case, I'm saying it's probably gonna be an, imp an impulse to the downside that retraces the entire rally because uh, the rally was a correction, right? As suggested by the way it channeled, right? I'm sorry? You mean wave, th we're, we're in now, the rally now? All right, it's a wave two rally. Wave two rallies usually are very sharp, right? In fact, in fact, we haven't even consumed as much time uh, in wave two 
as we consumed in all of wave one. That's not going to be until July. So if I were, you know, I might be looking for a top in equities in July if we continue to go higher. Well, I mean, just in July. Well, it, it, time wouldn't matter. I mean, um, it's just in time, whether it's weeks or days or months or whatever. The decline from, in, you're talking about the Dow, the decline from the uh, 2007 high to the 09 low took whatever it was. I mean, that's what, 12, 15, what was it, 17 months? So we haven't had, we haven't spent 17 months since March of 09 yet. No, no. That from, we went from an extreme high. It couldn't be a third wave. Let's look at the Dow chart I have here. What is that? Oh, oh. Here's the Dow chart, right? Wave five ended a large degree cycle wave five, probably, ended way up here. This first decline is wave one. This rally in now to where we are currently is wave two. You see? One, two. This is a, a quarterly scale, so or a monthly scale, so it's a big chart. But, no, that's one and two, in my estimation. Yeah. Right, but again, this is a monthly chart. So we could trade back and forth for years, you know? I mean, this isn't like an hourly chart, you know? Right, I mean, just, I'm just saying from a very long-term perspective. I mean, this is a huge, this goes back to the 1800s, this chart. So yeah, this you know again it could happen tomorrow, but probably not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, the euro chart, which the the one this one or uh, I don't know. right this one? Okay. I'm sorry. Mm hmm. Well, well, wait, okay, so if you want to enter after wave one, you're looking for a three wave correction of some sort. Uh, the best way to do it, and I mentioned this here, is to look for, uh, you know, I'll say on an hourly chart, this is an hourly chart, you, you use the channeling technique with corrections, which is connect a line from here, right, to, you know, here, or it would be here, roughly the same, and then extend it from the high. You corrections tend to channel just in different ways than impulses do, right? And the combined with the fact that it reversed and met resistance at the 61.8% of the prior decline, also, combined with the fact that it was former resistance, which was also a former gap, I mean, this is like just screams resistance, right? So all that you have in your favor. So, I mean, is there one commit, like way where you say, you know, if this happens and this happens, then I go short? You know, I don't, I don't work, you know, that way as far as my trading, because it's not all automated. But I'm looking for tendencies you know, did the rally have a tendency to fit in a channel? And if it did, you know, what did the price action look like at the top of the channel? And, you know, maybe it's a good time to go short. Yeah, just not 100.0001. Right, exactly. If you do that, then you're still in the prior trend. No, well, you'd have to abandon and figure out what's going on because at that point you might be, you know, you don't know where the trend line is, you know. No, I mean, they're not going to. I mean, they're usually sharp, but it's pretty common that two-thirds, you'd be surprised. Well, 
Well, the, I, ideally, ideally, you'd want to uh, be able to catch the third wave because it's usually the longest, and it's usually the biggest move. That's the best. If you can do that, that's the best. If entering a wave two is the best, uh, but you know it's not always doable, obviously. I mean, you can't do it every time. But yeah, that would be the best, obviously. And from a very long-term perspective, the Dow chart that I've been showing, you know, we might be at wave two. Uh, we might be, or say, where are we? We might be at wave two now. You know, now or in the next several months. So it's just a very large degree trend, though. Do we have a question back here yet? No, that's just RSI. Uh, I have trend lines on it. Something I'll talk about tomorrow, but check this out. You see, whenever you've made major peak in RSI, okay, how this 1929 peak in RSI, we didn't reach that level again at price level for decades, okay, and then we had a peak in RSI in the 50s, but we didn't make the price high until the 60s. But again, we didn't reach back to that prior high for decades. Okay, we just had a peak in RSI in the late 90s, and we just had a, you know, the second peak or the divergence similar to the 50s, 60s, right, in the 08 high. So going on what's happened when we had peaks and divergences in RSI on a monthly basis, uh, I don't think we're going to make it back to the 2008 equity high for several decades. Right? That's what I was, that chart is the same. I'm going to talk about that chart tomorrow, too. Um, John Kicklider and I are doing a presentation on uh, forecasts and opportunities for the rest of the year and beyond and whatnot, so. All right, yeah, yeah. That is tomorrow at 1.30. Okay, all right, everyone, awesome. Have a good, fun evening, and I'll see you tomorrow.